Hello and welcome to Imagine Amazing, Oregon HFMA's podcast with its current president. We are so excited to be back with you for a third season. It's going to be an amazing one packed full of exciting content. Yes, so excited to be back doing the podcast. There's so much content coming to our followers this season, and we can't wait to share it with you all. In fact, to begin the season, we're being joined by a team of people who've been on the front lines or working with the front lines during the pandemic. They're here to share the impacts that they have seen and are seeing with the COVID surges and government mandates. As this is the President's Podcast, we are joined today by Oregon HFMA's 2020 through 2022 Chapter President, Tammy Kuhn, who will be providing us with important chapter updates and healthcare trends in Oregon. Tammy, I believe that you are one of the few chapter presidents in Oregon HFMA's history that has served two consecutive terms. Thank you for your leadership. We are so happy to have you join us today. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, thank you, Tammy. And as a reminder to our listeners, this podcast is available on all popular podcast platforms and is now viewable on Oregon HFMA's YouTube channel. To watch the podcast, pop some popcorn, go to YouTube, type in Oregon HFMA Imagine Amazing, click on the desired episode, sit back and enjoy. I'm one of your hosts, Jeff Johnson. And I'm the other host, Kelly Smith. Today's episode of Imagine Amazing is sponsored and made possible by one of Oregon HFMA's platinum sponsors, Evolve. Evolve is dedicated to constantly updating nuances of the insurance claims business. With the ever-changing environment of healthcare, Evolve has invested in enhancements to all areas of service and production and insurance claim filing and accounts receivable to provide best-of-class results for its clients. To learn more about Evolve, please visit www.evolve-business.com. Thank you, Evolve. Tammy Kuhn, it is so fantastic to get the chance to meet and chat with you. We've had a little break from doing the podcast, and it is so good to be back together. And this is shaping up to be quite an incredible season full of wonderful content. Uh, that it is, Jeff. I am so excited to be here. This is going to be a fantastic year. We have so much happening that greatly impacts healthcare finance. And we can't wait to share it with all of our fun topics and amazing guests with HFMA family and podcast followers. I really believe this is important that we remain connected as a chapter. This podcast remains a great way to share information, and I hope that the chapter members are not only listening and following the podcast, but they're sharing it with their peers. Yeah, that's a good point, Tammy. That's why we're doing this, right? To share information and and help educate others. And truly, it's our honor to get to host the podcast with you and to provide additional avenue of communication with Oregon HFMA members, those past, those present, and future ones that we hope to get as well. So Tammy, we understand that the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act has introduced a new regulation called Regulation F that will impact how healthcare collection vendors must interact with their patients. Sounds like it could have a big impact on the recovery of past two debt collection amounts. Can you share more? Yes, Kelly, I certainly can. So the FDCPA's uh, Regulation F is a new ruling that has a real potential to disrupt the success of healthcare's collection vendor partners. Regulation F provides a safe harbor from the FDCPAs, which prohibits any unauthorized third-party disclosure if a debt collector follows certain reasonable procedures when sending emails or text messages to consumers. The new regulation goes into effect on November 30th of 2021. Regulation F requires collection vendor partners to follow certain guidelines and to have additional information from healthcare systems in order to begin collecting on an account. What this means is that the most systems will need to work with their EMR systems to provide necessary data changes to their files, which is not always an easy task. Yet without providing the updated data requirements, the agency's ability to resolve an account and help a patient will be greatly limited. Oh my goodness. Well, Tammy, seems like there's always some new legislation that impacts our HFMA community. I can only imagine that making changes to an EMR file extract or system would be potentially challenging or at least time consuming to get it done. 
So based on your understanding of this regulation, when should an organization have their fixes in place in order to avoid any disruptions in the collection process with their vendor partners? So the healthcare systems and the providers, they're really going to want to make sure that they've met with their collection vendor partners and provided a solution by October 25th of 2021 in order to meet the timeline outlined by Regulation F. Again, the timeline for Regulation F is November 30th, so you should meet with those partners by October 25th. That's good information, Tammy. I had not heard about this. And so for our listeners, if they also wanted to learn a little bit more about the regulation, what would you recommend to them? So Kelly, there's a number of webinars and trainings that are occurring throughout the U.S. on this topic right now. So I would recommend starting with your collection agency vendor partners and working with them a a plan of attack. However, if you would like to learn more about this regulation on your own, you can go to their website or you can simply Google FDCPA Regulation F. We will also be discussing this at the upcoming problem solving session during our fall conference that is happening in Hood River, Oregon on October 13th through 15th of 2021. This event is going to be a both in-person and virtual event. The problem solving session is free for anyone. All it requires you to do for the free session is you have to register in the link by joining virtually, which happens on Wednesday, October 13th from 2.30 to 4.30. And I encourage everyone to go check it out. I do too. They're wonderful sessions, great brainstorming, great opportunity to meet with your your peers. So thank you, Tammy. Great reminder of the amazing networking and information sessions that are constantly being offered by the chapter. And again, if anyone's interested in this free session, please go to www.oregonhfma.org to register for the event. And reminder also that this event is going to be virtual or in-person. So our first in-person in in over a year. So very excited to offer that this time. So please, whether virtual or in-person, it'll be easy to join, listen, and participate. And how you decide to attend is up to you. We want to make sure folks feel comfortable Uh, But please do check it out and uh, come join us. We'll, We'll look forward to that. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I'd love to have you share a little bit more about today's podcast and the special guests that you've invited. So thanks, Kelly. I'm very interested in today's podcast. With so many mandates being imposed on healthcare systems by the local and federal government, I thought it would be valuable to discuss the impacts of the mandates of the impact to healthcare systems in Oregon. You know, Tammy, it is so interesting that you picked this topic, truly. I was just on the phone the other day with a friend of mine who is a doctor in the Tri-Cities, Washington. He's part of a healthcare system there, which has uh, thousands of employees, but due to the vaccine mandate, they have lost hundreds of those. He was actually uh, invited to attend a mandatory session at his hospital where they discussed who will and who will not receive treatment when they come to the door, since they don't have adequate staffing to handle everyone Hmm. who walks in. And so from a patient standpoint, from my standpoint, that raises some concerns for me. You know, if, am I going to be one of those people that shows up at a door of a hospital with a real need? And then I'm just suddenly not treated because there's not staffing available to do that. Or they had to make some decisions because of a lack of staffing. I can't wait to hear what our guests have to say about what's trending in Oregon and what they're doing or how they're facing similar challenges. Do you want to introduce your guests to our listeners? I do. Thank you. I'm very excited today to have Andrea Mazores with OHSU and Wendy Applin with Mid-Columbia Medical Center. Welcome ladies, and can you go ahead and share a little bit about yourselves? I'm Andrea Mazoris, and I'm the Revenue Cycle Integrity Director for OHSU. So um, we have definitely seen quite an impact with this vaccine mandate, so I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to say as well. I'm Wendy Applin. I'm the CFO for uh, Mid-Columbia Medical Center. We are a rural health system here in the Columbia River Gorge. Um, We sit right on the Oregon border between Oregon and Washington. And so um, we get to juggle both um, 
state's mandates, as well as the federal mandate that's soon to come out. Um, so it's an interesting topic and it's on the forefront of everybody's uh, mind right now. Pretty much my whole day is spent talking about what, how we're going to address it. So it'll be interesting to hear what the others have to say. Oh, that's great. You two, we're very excited to have you. And I agree, this is certainly a very current and hot topic. Uh, it doesn't just affect Oregon. Of course, this is a national issue at this point. And so hearing from many hospital systems and vendor partners, how they're being impacted by this. And I think we tend to think about staffing issues affecting hospitals as the frontline staff, but certainly it also impacts revenue cycle. And so today I'm really interested to focus in on that and understand how it's affecting your areas. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question. And Wendy, I'll look to you for, for a response on this and then Andrea give you a chance as well. But my first question is, how did your organization approach the vaccine mandate? And specifically, in a revenue cycle environment, how does your policy affect both those employees who are patient-facing as well as those that are remote workers? Well, it impacts everybody that works here. If you uh, receive a check from MCMC, you're impacted. And given that MCMC is the largest employer in our, in our city and region, it is very impactful. And so for those patient facing, um, you know, it's been really challenging because it impacts everybody. Um, for those that have made the decision not to be vaccinated, how much it impacts their peers is still unknown at this point. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll learn more. Um, the governor of the state of Oregon, um, her mandate goes into effect on October 18th. And so if you back up from the, that date, um, folks need to be vaccinated by the 4th, which is Monday, in order to have the two-week uh, two time period um, to make the um, vaccine effective. Um, so patient facing definitely highly impacted. Um, then also patient facing impacted from the standpoint of um, those that are getting the disease and getting sick or getting the illness and getting sick. So we've had um, pockets of areas where, you know, despite um, having excellent PPE practices and sanitation practices, um, you know, it seems to spread. And so we'll have one unit that, you know, all of a sudden 30 to 40 percent of the staff is out. And so then it impacts the other units in the hospital that have to send staff to the unit that's impacted. So patient, patient facing is, is um, it's highly impacted and it's getting to the point of um, it's past exhaustion. The, the caregivers are just really tired. Um, they're frustrated, maybe a bit angry in some instances um, and trying to, you know, deliver safe, effective care like they always have. But in the environment, it just is so tough. And then <clears throat> non-patient facing, um, kind of the world I live in, we as an organization made the decision to go ahead and, um, you know, go to work, um, be in our space. Um, we felt that if the patients or the caregivers we're having to deal with this, you know, day to day and go to work. We wanted to support them. And our idea of supporting them was to show up just like they did. So some of us, like myself, I'm in a um, patient care building. Um, and so there's, you know, patients all, all around us. And we, we um, you know, scan in at the door every day. Um, we have requirements to wear PPE in all areas. And so it, it's, uh, it's affected us as well. Um, and then we have um, folks that, you know, like all areas have chosen not to be vaccinated as well. And we're a small rural organization. And so for small departments, um, in some cases, the entire department it hasn't been vaccinated. Um, the example I give here is payroll. 
And so that's a, a major you know, impact to the organization if we can't pay people. So it, it is um, evolving. And again, we won't know the true impact for a couple of weeks, but we're all scrambling to work through it. You know, as you talk about that, can I just, you know, the example that I shared of my friend who from a, again, that's external that you're talking about from a medical procedure, they're deciding what they can and cannot do and what they're willing to take on from a financial standpoint. Have, have those discussions already happened internally of what you guys are going to be taking on financially and what you're willing to not touch? You know, it's hard <clears throat> because we've had to um, limit our surgeries. We haven't turned them off, but we've had to certainly limit them. We've had to push the schedules out for patient care things like, um, you know, scoping patients, endoscopies and colonoscopies. We can't do them right now. And that one is really kind of special cause in the fact that um, we have to take that staff and put them on the nursing units because the nursing units were so short. So um, that's a decision we made. We felt like in most cases that wasn't life threatening and um, we could delay that care for a period of time. But yeah, financially it's gonna be an impact to us. Um, the other part that's financially impacting us is um, finding a place of disposition that's safe for these patients because oftentimes the nursing homes aren't able to take them. And so then we get you know, patients that languish in the bed and mm -hmm. they really don't need to be here, don't want to be here, quite frankly, but we don't see that it's safe to discharge them, so we keep them. And of course, that's not um, truly revenue generating. You know, So it, it is gonna have a financial impact and, um, Wasco County is one of the highest um, counties in the state of Oregon with a COVID positive percentage. And so, you know, small and mighty, but boy, we have been impacted by this. Mm -hmm. Andrea, what your experience has been at OHSU? Sure. It's, it's a high impact, um, definitely. I, I think we are unique in that most of our revenue cycle staff were already remote workers. And so we were fortunate in that we were able to send all of us home and be safe um, for the majority of the pandemic. But we have also had to redeploy staff to cover other units, um, maybe things that they didn't ever have any experience doing just so we could help with this recent surge. I think in terms of the policy impact, um, it, it really impacts all of OHSU's workers, including the remote staff. So we will see a very um, big shift and hopefully not too much. Like Wendy said, we won't know until um, the 18th of October what the true impact will be. Um, the only exception is our fully remote nurses. There was actually a previous Oregon law that did not require a fully remote um, license holding nurse, as few other practitioners as well, to get a vaccine. So our CDI nurses, for example, are exempt from this policy, but a rare few. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think just listening to both of you talk about this sort of sets at home for a really what different organizations are experiencing and, and that it really is a, a hardship. So as you think about the risks, the financial risks, um, the people risks that you've started to uh, talk about here, is there anything that you're able to do to help mitigate the risks? Great question. Yeah, I think that, you know, we've tried to be really creative with um, how we staff things. And so, you know, um, deploying um, different staff to different units. Um, we've stopped um, housekeeping services in non-patient care areas on a daily basis and doing it, you know, down to like one day a week. So, you know, I, I take my trash out myself. And 
others do as well. But um, you know, trying to be creative and, and take take staff that has been in some of our um, MOBs and redeploy them to the hospital. Um, and then, you know, just um, different areas we've had to rotate around. We've had to close services for certain. When we had, um, it happened early on, but we had a, a medical spa, if you will, um, in our Water's Edge clinic and we had to permanently close that down because oh, we, no. we couldn't see the services coming back anytime soon. And so, um, and, and like everybody with your fitness centers, we've had to, um, you know, limit hours in the fitness center and allow only so many people per hundred feet. And so that's been challenging. And in the clinical areas, we've had to do the same thing is reschedule patients <clears throat> uh, multiple times for care that, used to be you you got them you know whatever you wanted um but we are you know there so there is a lot of risk and i don't think we're gonna know until you know we dream every day that this is the worst and tomorrow will be better right that's that's the, the hope and and we're still hopeful that we're on the down and we are slightly on the downward curve but until we get to a, a place that um, you know, feels more comfortable from a community standpoint, the organization is going to have financial risk. There's no doubt about it. I'm so sad to hear about the spa thing because I love the spa at your facility. So that's really sad. Andrea? You know, I think um, a big impact that we are currently facing, of course, is uh, whether or not we can recruit for someone who's potentially not going to comply and whether or not that position um, has the ability to have a temporary staff. So we are actively engaging um, with quite a few different um, temporary agencies right now. And I think, you know, particularly our, our coding staff will have an impact, which is classically challenging to recruit for. Um, so quite a few of our, our coding operations could potentially be impacted. And like Wendy mentioned a couple times, we, we won't know until we know, um, but we are actively engaged in a few different agencies to see if we can mitigate that before we get the true impact. I think where, where we are still challenged is we've got some very key stakeholder roles that could also be in jeopardy. So, you know, it's not, it's not a temporary worker solution. So I think just trying to be creative with the departments, um, the managers in particular, to see where we can shift and review those current workflows. Do we have an opportunity to cross train? Do we maybe have an opportunity to work with other managers in other areas to um, try to share some of that workload? So it'll be an interesting few weeks. Yeah, it sounds like it really will because that, that's a lot of work, right? To suddenly sit down and, and strategize on how to move people here and there and, and workload from one person to another. Because what happens to your workload when you're off strategizing to move it, right? There's another piece that's not getting done. So that's just blows my mind. Um, and the other work, thing, right? Oh, sorry, Jeff. The other thing occurs to me is it's difficult on both ends. It's difficult to lose folks. And it's also difficult at this time to recruit folks because our candidate pool now for external hires is possibly reduced if we have a, a vaccine requirement and less individuals from the community who might be applying and who otherwise would be eligible are, are no longer eligible. So I think we're going to see the impact of this for some time. Okay, that's a great point. It really is. You know, I just curious along those lines, knowing that, and you guys know that you may lose some employees based on the mandate, based on their personal beliefs. Is there anything you're doing, any strategy you're doing with all of your staff to encourage them to stay by getting vaccinated? Or is there a campaign? Are you guys marketing internally? Just curious what each organization is doing. Well, I can't say that we're, we're marketing it. We're, you know, 
respecting every individual's right in their decision making. Um, <clears throat> but we are, I would say, um, emphasizing the impact to their teammates and, and trying to, you know, emphasize that this goes beyond, uh, beyond you in your beliefs, it, it goes to your team and it goes beyond them. And so, you know, and, and to the point too, where, where we said, you know, where um, real estate wise, it's difficult to get in and out of here quickly. And so we've had several cases that we've tried to, you know, find a different disposition because it was a high, higher level of care needed and we couldn't find, you know, their stories of ED docs calling 50 other facilities and um, getting no takers. And then we're caring for a patient that we're uncomfortable about caring for them, but we don't have any other choice. So we're trying to emphasize to everybody that this is, you know, it could impact you because you may choose not to get vaccinated. And then, um, you know, let's say you get in a terrible car accident on your way home from work. Um, that that's going to impact you because you may not be able to be cared for the way you need to be cared for if you were in an accident. So um, you know it's 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 hard because you you want everybody to do what you your opinion is is the right thing, but it may not be right for them, and so you have to respect that and just say okay, if that's the decision that you know that's right for you then I'm going to have to make other decisions. And, you know, and they may not be favored. And certainly I'm not enjoying making those decisions. But, you know, we have to continue to carry on, be able to do, deliver care here. You know, it's same same for OHSU. I think largely we, of course, are a, are a very large public health entity. And so we are, you know, supporting um, this vaccine initiative strongly at a high level. But I think at the end of the day, Wendy's right, you you have to respect everyone's personal choices and beliefs. So I wouldn't say that we are campaigning, we're having those individual conversations to at least um, let someone know what their options might be and to try to understand a little bit more of what choice they might make to see how that impacts the team. Um, I think some employees have chosen to still think about this uh, mm -hmm. for their own personal beliefs. So they may not have even made the decision yet. And I think as we're coming upon Monday, October 4th, which Wendy mentioned is our deadline for being um, fully compliant by October 18th, because that would be your last day to get your vaccine, and have a two week window, um, we might not have staff making that choice until the 18th of October. So that's another impact that we have to think about is, is you may have made that choice now on let's say October 19th, and you now have to go on leave without pay for that period of time to become compliant um, so I do think that we've made staff very, very aware of what the risks are, but at this time we're trying to respect everyone's privacy and just have those personal conversations. That's a great, great information. Thank you for sharing both of you. Yeah, it does make me think too, as we talk about respecting individual beliefs, we do have both medical and religious exceptions out there. And so, Andre, what is OHSU doing to help honor those certain ex exceptions? Sure. So all of our religious and medical exceptions are being reviewed currently. Um, OHSU put together a pretty comprehensive and diverse panel of stakeholders from a variety of departments, such as uh, diversity and inclusion and HR, legal, making sure that we get lots of representation. So they will be reviewing each and every medical and religious exception um, with the hopes to get as much resolution as we can in, in the next week or so. Um, and at least get some of those back. 
but I, I think that um, it will be interesting to know what our next steps are in terms of, um, you know, we, some, some organizations are allowing a test out option, for example. And at this point, OHSU has not, um, has not gone through with the test out option. They have stated that you need to be fully compliant and that means that your religious or medical exception needs to be fully approved or you need to have that full vaccination status. So I think, you know, we're hoping that this great panel that we've put together can really take a look at each one of those and get us the results quickly. Yeah, and I would say um, we're in the same place that we have both the religious and the medical exception. Um, and the providers in the community have had discussions about this and they're being very, very specific um, about the type of exception they're going to grant. And it's very, so far, it's been very, very limited. And they have their criteria. And if it doesn't meet their criteria, the answer is we will not, you know, we will not approve it. On the religious um, exception, uh, we're doing the same thing. We've got a, a group of folks and we're discerning those as they're submitted. So they have the form and they're submitting the form and they're being discerned every day. Um, and then the leader of whoever that person reports to gets an email saying, um, this person has a, a religious uh, exception and it has been approved. Um, this is what they need to do. They need to have, um, they're issued a special mask. So they're gonna have a higher level of masking that they have to make, have to use. And then also continue with the, you know, the daily scanning in. Um, and as well as we've um, elected to have weekly testing for those individuals. And so they have to, they have to test every week. And then, you know, we're, we're still working through um, yes, we will be paying for it. So another financial impact um, and working through if, if the test is, you know, negative, how we, how we inform everybody, if the test is positive, how we keep HIPAA compliant, compliant but yet inform people. And so um, we've, uh, we know those that have already submitted their exceptions. We, we know which ones have been approved but there have been many that have been rejected. And so it's not an automatic approval. Thank you for those responses. I, just a quick question for both of you. You know, you both mentioned fully vaccinated being one of those requirements that's been adopted by your organizations. What does fully vaccinated mean? We know that a new booster just hit are, are people over that age that the recommendation is they get it, that they're out of compliance if they don't have the booster shot or what really is fully vaccinated? For us, it's, it's we're, we're applying the, you have to be fully vaccinated, meaning two vaccines um, within the designated period. You know, one is a 28 day wait, one's a 30 day wait. Um, and then, we are we are not applying the booster at this time this is a temporary order for the state of oregon that expires at the end of um, january now it obviously can be extended after that time but at this point um, the it's not quite available to us it is for those folks that have um, immune compromised conditions and so they they can have it and we we encourage them to get it but we're not saying that that is a requirement at this point in time. Awesome, thanks for clarifying. Is that the same for you, Andrea? Um, yeah, so at this time, just the two vaccines or the one Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and we are um, actively promoting the boosters for our health um, employees currently, but that's not part of the requirement at this time. Okay. Very good. Thanks for clarifying because I was sitting here, just had that thought on my mind. Mm -hmm. I had a question also about the staff themselves. So two parts here for you. Let's say someone chooses early on not to get the vaccine. And so 
their employment is terminated, if they come back later and have received the vaccines, would they be eligible for rehire in your organization? And then if we go back to just regular testing as an option, would that same population be eligible? Your HR people probably don't want you to answer that, right? But I was just curious. It was a a question that we had. Well, if they were eligible to rehire regardless, then yes, they would be eligible. They would have to wait the prerequisite number of days to make sure the vaccine is fully effective. But yes, we're actually hoping that there'll be folks that um, after the 18th, maybe have a second thought about it and, and, and um, go ahead and, you know, get vaccinated. And if they do, we would look at their higher status when they left. And if it was, they were in good standing at that time, you know, yes, we would proceed with it. Um, so we're, we're hopeful. Matter of fact, we did buy some Johnson and Johnson, even though we're small, just just to make sure if we had some of those folks between October fourth and October eighteenth that wanted mm-hmm. to do that, that they could take the that vaccine, and then they would just be unpaid for um, you know the clearance period. That's good. One and done. Right on that one. Okay. Same for OHSU. Yeah, same for OHSU. And and I will also say the same in terms of, I, I think that we've already seen um, a, a handful of staff make that decision. I think we have also seen staff say, you know, I, I don't really feel comfortable getting this or that vaccine. I'd like the Pfizer, for example. And they've made that decision to start that process, even though they know that they won't be getting paid for a period of time. Um, so I, I foresee that we'll have that kind of happen again um, in between Monday and then the 18th and possibly even afterwards. Um, again, if they're in good standing, you know, we, we would love to have them back and hopefully we don't have to lose them to begin with. <laughs> I had another question, if that's okay. Just I, Kelly had touched on it before. She was asking both of you just about, you know, your creative ideas on working around this and I think all of you mentioned speaking to your vendor partners. Have there been a line that you've contracted with where you normally wouldn't have due to this new mandate? Well, I can't think of one that we, uh, I mean, yes, staffing vendors, specialty staffing vendors, therapies and, you know, ED nurses, ICU nurses. Yeah, we've, um, we've had some of those relationships before, but we've had a pretty stable workforce, so we haven't had to have that kind of support, but now we we definitely have reached out to those folks, as well as um, different locums, just because some of we're concerned in, in, in our areas where we have limited providers, if somebody gets sick, that you know we'll want some backup support for them. And then with other types of vendors, we've had to um, communicate to all of our vendors that they too have to be vaccinated if they're going to work for us. So the the vendors that, um, for example, clean some of our MOBs, um, they've had to tell their employees they they can't work there or can't work on our properties if they're not vaccinated. So it's going beyond just, you know, the true, true healthcare workers. But um, if anybody is definitely setting foot on the campus, then they have to be vaccinated. And, and then we're, we're handling remote a little bit differently, but I'll let Andrea, Andrea speak to OHSU. Yeah, I think we're, we're in a similar boat. Um, I will say that we have been working with vendor support for quite some time um, due to our mass vaccine clinics. So we're very familiar um, with some of the agencies that we will be recruiting through. So that's great news because we've had good relationships with them and and great success at finding um, wonderful employees during this time. I think the challenge, of course, is that everybody's looking for employees and particularly um, very specialized remote uh, workers who deal with revenue cycle. So, you know, like I said, a hard hit area for us will be coding, um, particularly because Um, subsets like inpatient coding 
are so, so specific and you really do need a very qualified person who has all of the certifications that they need. So finding someone um, not just in the state of Oregon, but in the entire country can be challenging at times. And that will require us to do a little bit more work with the vendors, where in the past, you know, if you're looking at someone in more of a front end role, like um, patient access, for example, you might easily be able to plug in some temporary staff to those roles. But when you start getting into the more specialization, your uh, your market needs to be a little bit larger. You need to see if that pool can come from the entire US and not just the state. So we'll also have challenges because of course this is happening across the nation right now. Yeah. That's a good and on the recruiting front, it's similar to that is, um, you know, our recruiters have to, you know, we have open positions just like everybody. And when somebody applies, um, they have to screen them and say, are you vaccinated or will you become vaccinated? So that's a new, you know, new kind of world for us. And um, we've been in kind of for some positions in the state of uh, interviewing people and, and making decisions. And then we've had people back out saying, oh yeah, I just found out about that mandate in Oregon. No way am I going to Oregon. Um, so, you know, it's impacted us in ways that we had had no idea. Um, and then you're just, we're not getting the level of response to open positions um, that we had before. Um, and we believe this has to, this is probably why. First, if you're upping the ante, then are, are your job descriptions, are you paying more or? I, I'm asking a CFO if she's going to pay yeah. more. TBD. Yeah, to be determined. All right. <laughs> That's fair enough, by the way. And Sorry Jeff, I wanted to share that on a personal note, I've really appreciated being part of the HFMA family through this whole event because I've had more reach outs from our vendor partners in the last few weeks asking, how are we doing? What do you need? How can we help you? So there's a lot of concern in the community and with our vendor partners and offering assistance where they can. So that's been a, a, certainly a benefit of being part of this organization. That's awesome. We truly appreciate all of the feedback that you have provided to us. I know we asked a lot of surprise questions and you just <laughs> ran with it. So thank you so much. Yes. Thank you guys for being on the podcast today. It was fascinating to hear about what's trending and how the providers uh, can respond. Oh, I agree too. Thank you so much to both of you for joining today. And now Tammy wanted to give you just a few minutes to tell us about some chapter updates that we have coming. Excellent. So as a reminder, we have our fall conference happening October 13th through 15th in Hood River at the Best Western in Hood River. So um, it's going to be a hybrid event. So meaning in person and virtual. So pick your comfort level and please join us either way. Uh, to register for the session, you can uh, go to our website at www.oregonhfma.org. We hope to see you there. Well, thank you, Tammy. And thank you, guests. Today's information was awesome. Honestly, it was. I learned so much about what you guys are facing. And truly, I am just praying for you guys. It, it, it'll all work out. And um, I personally am already registered for the upcoming conference. And I cannot wait. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, me too. I'm registered for in-person. So first one in quite a while. I can't wait to go. Me too. Um, and I'll, I'll see you guys there. Oh, good. Excellent. Yeah, just down the street Yay. for you. Yeah, not, not far away. So I was thrilled. Good. Well, hopefully everyone will take advantage of the information shared in today's podcast and join us for the upcoming conference. And meanwhile, we'd like to once again thank everyone for joining us today on this podcast and extend the warmest wishes to all Oregon HFMA members. And again, want to thank our amazing healthcare heroes who continue to work at making our lives healthier and happier every day. So thank you, everyone. This episode of Imagine Amazing is brought to you today by Evolve. To learn more about Evolve, please visit www.evolve-business.com. Thank you so much, Evolve. 
This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, and all other popular podcast platforms, as well as YouTube. Please find us, like us, and follow us for exciting content in 2021 and 2022. Also, to learn more about Oregon HFMA, please visit us at www.oregonhfma.org.